Hi, everyone. Um, uh, today I'm going to talk about a new series that Baker is developing. We're called BSC Mythbusters, and the first one in the whole entire series you get to see today. Does heat really affect my protection? So if you're familiar with the show, you know that these guys who we're not affiliated with find myths and test them out and theoretically and then practically and try and solve them. So we're going to do the same thing but with biosafety cabinets. So. There are a lot of rules, guidelines, rumors, even myths about how to use a biosafety cabinet. So we're gonna determine which ones are true, which ones are not, and more importantly, why. So as a brief overview, a biosafety cabinet is a ventilated enclosure for work with biohazard agents assigned to biosafety levels one through four. They provide three levels of containment, personnel, product, and environmental. So that protects the person using it, the thing you're working on, and the surrounding areas, so your lab, the building, etc. All BSCs contain one or more HEPA filters and a motor blower. Today we're going to focus on the Class II Type A2 biosafety cabinet. These provide all three levels of containment, so personnel, product, and environment, for particulates and aerosols. As you can see, there's an airflow diagram there showing the uh, airflow pattern throughout the cabinet. So you have 100 feet per minute airflow coming in through the front. It mixes with any sort of contaminated air being pulled up through the motor blower, pushed into a partial a positive pressure plenum where part of the air is exhausted through an exhaust HEPA filter, providing your environmental protection. And then the majority of the air is pushed down through a supply HEPA filter, providing product protection. No air is allowed to escape out the front, providing personnel protection. So here's a little video about how a biosafety cabinet should be operating. You have a strong front intake air showing all the air coming straight in through the front, as well as through the side suction slots. There they are. Both of them provide a strong inward flow of air to protect the person so no air can come out. The next you'll see the downward HEPA filtered air. This bathes the entire work area in clean air so that no particulates will contaminate your product or what you're working on. And because you're hitting a solid surface, the air needs to go somewhere, so it splits and goes some into the front and some into the back. And that's why it's very important not to block those suction slots. The Momenta air curtain is specific for Baker, and it comes a thin, quick stream of air down through the front, and it provides an extra barrier to protect the person. Now on to the myth. The myth is don't use a heat source in a biosafety cabinet. And the theoretical reasoning behind this is that the gas needed to light the flame would be dangerous flowing around a hot BSC motor or just within the cabinet. Also, heat changes the airflow dynamics within the biosafety cabinet that are critical for safety. So here on the diagram, we've added a little flame, and as you know, heat rises, which is counterintuitive to the downward flowing air. This will cause eddies and could lead to con sources of contamination. So we're going to attack each bit of those separately. So if you remember two years ago, I presented on volatile chemical use in a biosafety cabinet. So using all of that work that we determined before, and if you need more of that, it's on our website, we can determine how much chemical the cabinet can handle. So either propane or natural gas. Using both of those, we go through the calculations, and you can put in 10 to 20 milliliters per minute of propane or natural gas into a biosafety cabinet and it would stay within the lower explosion limit, at least 10% of that. So it's a very safe amount. And to relate that, the release rate of propane from the tank to a Bunsen burner is about 100-fold less. So we can say this myth is busted, but it has a very large asterisk on it. That is if there's no spark, flame, crack tubing, leaky valves, etc. So there are a lot of problems that could go wrong with putting gas into a biosafety cabinet. But if everything is perfect, the cabinet could handle it. So we still like to say, because there are so many things that go wrong, please don't put flammable gas in a biosafety cabinet. All right, now moving on to the spontaneous ignition. So if you have the gas flowing around a hot motor, would it actually ignite on its own? So the auto ignition temperature of propane is 504 degrees Celsius. The maximum allowable temperature for a motor blower is only 150. So this myth would be busted with that asterisk if there's no spark, flame, leaky valves, crack tubing, etc. So please don't put gas in a biosafety cabinet. 
So if you're a fan of the show, you know that this is the portion. They did all the math. Now they go out and try and blow up the cabinet. We didn't do this. Um, I, my bosses wouldn't let me. We tried. But this has happened a lot. So here are some examples of when this has happened. And we actually hear stories about this a lot with the certifiers who have to tent a biosafety cabinet to do a decontamination. So they tent the cabinet and a valve has been left on or there's leaky tubing and they go to light the flame for the formaldehyde and the cabinet explodes. So please, please, please don't put gas in a cabinet. All right, now on to the more gritty bit, so the airflow disruption. We can look at this a few different ways. We can look visually with smoke or we can do um, containment testing. So we can look on the biosafety cabinet's performance. And this is done either through particle counting or the NSF International Standard 49 microbiological testing that all of your cabinets have been certified to. They have three different tests, the personnel test, the product test, and the cross-contamination test, which actually tells you how far away from the source of contamination you can be. You should be with uh, further than 14 inches away from the source, should be safe. We used four different sources of heat. So we have common ones that have been found in the lab. We have a stand standard Bunsen burner, a high heat Bunsen burner, um, a back incinerator, which is actually an electric source, so it's more of a small furnace, and a spirit lamp. So we have three different heights of flame because we thought that maybe how tall the flame was would be affecting it. We have two that use gas, one that uses ethanol, and then one that uses electricity, so we could remove the gas aspect from the testing. So we noticed some problems right away. It was incredibly hard to actually light the flames inside a windy biosafety cabinet and make sure that the flame stayed lit the entire duration of the experiment. So I don't know why people do this. The thing is flames all over. You can see the flames completely sideways. Like, how would you want to work in that? All right. So now to look at it visually, we took theatrical smoke and put it through a long tube that has a lot of pinholes in it. So you have a nice curtain of smoke coming down. And you should be able to see a nice downward flow curtain across the back of the cabinet. But if you put a Brunson burner in there, you can see from this movie, a huge inward upward flow of air. Air should never ever move up in a biosafety cabinet. And this is just terrible. Okay. So we also did this with the other Bunsen burners. Shown on the bottom is what should normally occur, a nice smooth curtain from top to bottom flowing towards those in uh, front grates. And the high heat Bunsen burner looks like a hurricane in there. There's a whole lot of eddies going on where the air is swirling and that leads to a huge source of contamination. Um, we thought maybe not putting the Bunsen burner in the center of the cabinet would make it better. So if we tuck it in the back corner, maybe it'll be safe there. So we have the bur burner in both the cabinets, but it is off in the lower in the movie. So you can see the air swirling around the off Bunsen burner, but you have a nice steady airflow next to it. When you turn the burner on, there's huge swirls of air that extend even past the midway point of the cabinet. See, this is extending a lot further away than was anticipated. Also, this is a six foot cabinet. It's quite a large distance. The spirit lamp and the back incinerator were slightly better, but you could still see little swoops coming up every once in a while, which with the other one, um, come on, play. There we go, upward swoops going with each type of heat. So now we're gonna move on to a little bit more uh, measurable metrics. So we took a six foot and a four foot cabinet, um, both A2 cabinets, and split the work zone into different areas. So we could, if we placed the Bunsen burner in different locations, maybe we would get different results. So we labeled them A through F. All experiments were done with an eight inch op sash opening because that is the most restrictive and I thought we'd actually give the cabinet a chance. The greater you open the sash opening, the harder the cabinet has to work. So, with particle counting, can the cabinet maintain ISO class 5 air? So we put the particle counter right in the front because we wanted to measure if any um, particles were coming in towards the cabinet. That's where it really matters. Surprisingly, the spirit lamp and the back incinerator passed. They were able to maintain ISO class 5. However, the Bunsen burner in these two locations failed. 
and the high heat failed as well. So what this tells us is that the taller flames are actually affecting our momentum air curtain and the intake air, causing too much disruption, leading to potential sources of contamination coming into your cabinet, and that would be affecting your product protection. Just a little side note, HEPA filters are not immune to flames. Um, this is actually charring marks and melting of the HEPA filters. So if your flame is getting a little too tall, you could actually be causing holes to happen in your HEPA filters. And there's another source of contamination. All right, now moving on to the meat. We did aerosol biological testing uh, in accordance with NSF International Standard 49. And we used the back four locations for this one. We figured very few people would be putting the Bunsen burner directly against their belly up in the front. I'm sure people do it, but we're assuming that most people wouldn't. Um, and we only tested locations B and C for the cross-contamination test just due to the configuration of how the cross-contamination test is set up. If you need a reminder, there's the pass-fail criteria for how many colonies are allowed for each test. So here are the results. The Bunsen burner actually passed the personnel test, so it did not allow any bacterial spores to escape the cabinet in the six-foot cabinet. But when you brought it down to the four-foot cabinet, it actually failed. Pretty bad, actually. So the four out of four means four locations all passed. Three out of four would be three out of four failed here. Um, and then I list which ones were which. So you could see that in the six-foot cabinet, they actually stood a chance. There were some passings, but when you get down to the four-foot cabinet, everything is failing. And an asterisk means that it failed especially bad. There was so much bacteria on those plates. The high-heat Bunsen burner did worse, as expected. A lot more heat, a lot more disruptions. And again, all four locations were affected. When we got to the back incinerator, there were some passings, but um, still failures were popping up. Um, in the six foot cabinet, um, it seemed like the one on the side and on the back seemed to do have problems. But when we get down to the four foot cabinet, all four sites seem to be affected. The spirit lamp was a special little guy here. His flame would bounce around a lot, leaving a lot of variation in our results. So within our replicates, some of the replicates would pass and some would be spectacular failures. So there's like so much variability because of the flame. The flame wasn't as sturdy as a Bunsen burner's flame. Um, and so we still were seeing um, failures in the different locations. When we did the cross-contamination test, we also set this up so that we could get an extra little bit of information. So on the right-hand side, you see the nebulizer that is spraying bacteria across the um, length of the biosafety cabinet. Each of those yellow circles represents a petri dish, and then the Bunsen burner was placed in the back corner at B. And the NSF testing dictates that you start the petri dishes at least 14 inches away from the nebulizer, because within 14 inches, it, there should be some um, spreading, but beyond that point, you should get no colonies. And up to at least 23 inches away when we stopped putting the plates out, we were still seeing contamination that far away from the um, contamination source. So in order to try and see if we could find a safe zone in the cabinet, spoiler alert, you can't. So a few things to note, um, heat built up incredibly quickly in this cabinet. We saw heat increases of over 10 degrees Celsius within a matter of minutes. They got worse um, the longer that the flames were on. The results in the four foot cabinet were way worse than the six foot. And that makes sense. You have a smaller work area, less heat um, dissipation, and so you have greater airflow disruptions. And even the aerosol generation out of the nebulizer was affected. So as the nebulizers are spraying bacteria out, you could see that it was flowing all over the place, leading to more variation, also something you don't want. So in conclusion, heat sources in a biosafety cabinet cause problems. There are major airflow disruptions. Your personal product and cross-contamination tests are compromised. And Oh, please don't put gas in a biosafety cabinet. What's more surprising is that the entire work surface was affected. There wasn't a place that you could get away from the, the flame. Even if it is in the back corner and you're working on the other side, you still would uh, lose your protection. So 
a Bunsen burner alone on the bench would be safe. Working in a biosafety cabinet without a flame, safe, you know, given you will use proper procedures. Burner inside negates both of them. You're better off doing one or the other. So we're gonna mark this myth as true. You should not use heat sources in a biosafety cabinet. Some alternative solutions. Um, you could segregate your work so that you're doing flame work outside and then work in the cabinet. You could try eliminating the, the flame using a touch heat source or disposable loops, sterilized toothpicks, et cetera, or try and reassess what you're actually trying to do. Please don't be that guy. Um, some upcoming myth busters you'll see from us. How about two or more people in a biosafety cabinet? <laughs> I can guarantee their cross-contamination is compromised. How about how overloaded is a biosafety cabinet? <laughs> so we're gonna see how much stuff you can actually put in there while, before compromising your safety. So please help us spread the word about these myths, and if you have any other myths that you'd like to be busted, please send them to me. Thank you.